welcome to the power of one. We as African Americans has come a long way and I am truly grateful for those who have paved the way for me. They made it easier for me to live my dreams and to know the sky is the limit. And for that, I am truly grateful. Today, I will be speaking with Ms. Trudy Hayes, a beautiful African-American who displays professionalism, class, grace, and style. Welcome to the show, Ms. Trudy. Ms. Hayes, in 1963, you became the first African-American weather reporter on ABC's WXYZ TV in Southfield, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit. How was it working in a news station and you were the only African-American? It feels lonely. <laughs> it feels lonely. Okay. I think uh, all of us feel that way when you're first up there someplace where you don't have, you know, someone to talk to sometimes or to even copy or watch and look at and say, I want to be like that. You know, so you feel a little lonely, but I mean, if you're there, you're there. That's true. That is so, <laughs> so um, we feel lonely in lots of ways. I feel lonely now uh, at times because I don't have someone to talk to. I don't have a lot of family and oh. um, we have to be, you know, to ourselves. So often, I, I'm tired. It's fatiguing, really. It, but yeah. I have enough to keep me busy. On the other hand, and I didn't have time to get lonely, maybe I didn't like some of the company that I met, but I wouldn't say that they weren't there. You see what I mean? Right. Yes. So it's yes. kind of a mixed feeling. But in the end, after all the day, after the day, and you go home and you look back at it, you accomplished something. You were right. there. You stuck to it. Right. And so yeah. let's face the next one. Okay. When you used to cover stories in the 60s, did you receive a lot of resistance because you were African-American? To be honest with you, Melanie, I have never felt a lot of resistance. Good. I don't know why. I don't know how it happened to me. But resistance was not in my category. Um, there were times. Of course, you do feel letters that are unanswered. You get phone calls that people don't say anything, but what they're going to say and hang up, they don't identify themselves. But you can't grasp those. You can't talk to those people. So the rest of it is face to face. And what I did feel most of the time, I was feel I felt welcome. I didn't, I didn't experience um, nasty words turning around only in two occasions the whole time that I was there face to face did I feel or was I presented with we don't want you now I felt a lot of it in Philadelphia and I was surprised because I was really? looking for a place to live and a lot of places slammed the door in my face they told me you're not wanted here go someplace else you can't come here those kind of things from a lot of people Wow. And right in Center City. Yeah. So a lot of it came from the people on the outside. Uh, a lot of people did phone me, you know, hey, you get off the air, bang. What are you going to do? You can't do anything about that. Right. And um, so it, it was kind of a reverse situation. The people I worked with, I guess they felt uh, obligated to treat me well, but some of them were very nice. Vince Leonard. Mort Krim, Marsha Rose, you know, if they resented me, they didn't show it. Maybe they were afraid to do that because they would be reprehended. So I, I don't, I can't say that people were throwing rocks at me, <laughs> that were pushing me away, or those kind of things. It didn't happen to me. That's, that's very good to hear. Now, did you have to have experience to report the weather? Where was I getting it from? <laughs> I let me tell you how it happened. Okay. I I I had been working for a radio station 
-hmm. And I like to tell this particular part of the story because it was the first uh, owned and built, built and owned radio station in Detroit. And that was the first one north of the Mason Dixon line. So that was in itself was an accomplishment to be working there. And I got that from, I, I got that job working um, at this radio station because I was invited to a lot of different events that called for uh, anyone that was in the business to be there. I sat at a table with a couple of gentlemen and ladies and I heard one of them say he was looking for a new uh, weather girl. I overheard him. And when I got back to my office at the radio station, I called them and I told them that I overheard the conversation and I wondered what he was looking for. Do you have, he said, yes, I am. Who do you have in mind? I said, me. <laughs> so he was brave enough to say, come on out. Let's see what you can do. And that's how it started for me. And he was the CEO of the station. So what he said was going to be. Now, he got a lot of letters. He got people threatening never to li listen to the station again and turn it off and, you know, that kind of thing. The foul language, the letters, all those kind of things. But he stuck by his gun. That's excellent. Now, how did you grow to become a news reporter and move from the weather? Well, I had started after being there a year doing weather, and I had an elaborate uh, background. You should have seen that when I would go upstairs and I'd point for Upper Michigan and Lower Michigan and what was going on on both sides. And the only way I got to know anything to report, well, first of all, let me go back a little bit. It was the station's habit, ABC, all over the country at that time to hire blonde, blue-eyed girls, shapely girls. I had none of that. Didn't have the blue eyes, didn't have the blonde hair, didn't even have white hair then. And I wasn't shapely, I was skinny as I could be. Uh, but I had some good advice from a male friend of mine who suggested if I was going to do the weather to learn some of the language. So he encouraged me to go out to the airport and to stick around the guys doing the weather for the airlines coming in to learn the language and to go to a children's library and get a book on geography and yeah. study up who, where, where, what was around me and how, how the weather would be around there. So I got to the point where I'd write little notes on my, on my uh, screen that couldn't be seen by you or the audience. And I put little things in, I can say, well, now up here and so and so, you know, they're having a blizzard and things like that I would do. Now it's kind of sneaky, but everybody has their little tricks. Right. That's how I got to tell the weather. In doing so, one day I got, um, a, I didn't get the call. The call came in for people to start. Let me see. In that time, no, they had a big um, um, overnight transitions for the automobile industry. They were moving a lot of people around to bring out, bring back the automobile industry. No one wanted to cover it because the, the sessions were at night and they would last until the wee hours of the morning. I volunteered, again, saying, I'll do it. So they said, well, we'll have somebody there. So let it go, I guess. That's the way they figured it. So I started learning something about the politics and all of the, I learned to play cards because all the fellas did was sit around and play cards waiting for uh, the representatives to come out and report that's the way that started. But I, so I started doing interviews that way. I even got to talk to um, Walter. Can't remember the names. I'm getting so old. But no, I just can't remember them all. But the guy that was put on the ground, so they say. Um, anyway, they were very top, top notch people in charge of the different air, of the different radio. Here I go again. Automobile station uh, cars. Anyway. One day, a year later, I got a call and they said, we've been watching you. Who are they? Who, who are they? They were CB, CB, uh, Westinghouse from Philadelphia. Yeah. And they said they had been watching me. How would I like to come to Philadelphia? And that's the way it started. 
Did you have yes. any hesitation moving from Detroit to Philadelphia at that time? No, because I was close to my home, which mm. is New York. And close to my, what little family I did have was on this side, the East Coast. And um, they offered me a bigger salary. So I had what no hesitation. <laughs> so I was very happy to get that promotion. Yeah. And that's how I got to Westinghouse um, and stayed there for the next 30 years. Wow. At the time when you were walking through this journey in your life, did it dawn on you that you were making history? Did it dawn on you that little African-American girls and little African-American young ladies wanted to follow in your footsteps? I think uh, most people would have reacted the same way. When you're up there by yourself, you're afraid, you're so afraid you do the best that you can. You know that you're being watched. You know that you're being copied. You know that the, somebody wants to move you out of that job, <laughs> waiting for you to make a mistake. And so you go home and you practice and you ape as much as you can from other people. We didn't have any of me, but there were other women that were coming along at that time and you try to perfect yourself and in ways that would be acceptable in what you were doing. But you also make a lot of mistakes. Mm. And making those mistakes is sort of, well, I can't do that one anymore. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember some of them as we're talking. And I, I know one time I called, um, oh, I made a lot of mistakes on na uh, name pronunciations. I made a mistake on one of my interviews thinking that I was still on radio. I had to cover someone coming in at the station, 33 station. And when I got time, you're on, I started describing what he was wearing, forgetting that you could see him. <laughs> I didn't have to say he had a hat on, an overcoat, and he had brown shoes. I didn't have to say that. And they kept telling me, cut it, cut it, cut it. Go to the interview. <laughs> so you make mistakes like that. Um, and I'm sure I mispronounced many, many words. And I was often very nervous. Yeah. Because I'm still being the only one, even when I came here, the only other person that was on air doing uh, a long time on air was Marsha Rose Shestak. And I'm sure she made so, a lot of mistakes in her time too, but we didn't become friendly at, at first. I have to say at first, because later on we paid, we, we became good friends, but at first we weren't friendly and we were kind of keeping a jaundiced eye on each other, you know. Mm -hmm. She was getting all the treatment. I wasn't getting the treatment that Marsha Rose got. They were fixing her up and giving her good clothes from the stores. There was a beautiful store on on uh, Walnut that she got her clothes. I got mine from Lit Brothers that they would loan me. It wasn't the same, same kind of store, but Anyway, we managed to do it until they stopped. Now they don't even do that anymore. What was the most valuable lesson you learned with being the faced what? with the most valuable lesson you learned with being faced with racism, inequality, and being viewed differently in other than your your white coworkers? I learned. I don't know if I learned it from them, but I learned to listen to people when they're talking. Yeah. And, and, and especially in an interview. Uh, a lot of people still prepare things, you know, on a piece of paper. Maybe I should have because I'm getting old now and forgetful. But at that point, I uh, depended on listening. And as a result of that, I very seldom had any problems with an interview. I would get my, my answers. So, in, for instance, I interviewed Joan Crawford, and when I finished, she told me that she was very nervous and that I, she thanked me. She said, you were very kind, you, you were great, you, you let me talk. She told me that that was the first interview she had away from the movie screen, the first live interview, and she thanked me for that. And a lot of people said that, through the years have told me that they appreciated my talking with them. They didn't mind answering. And I got a lot of things answered. I remember Julio Iglesias 
after interviewing him and we were taught, still talking, I said, I want to ask you one more thing. He said, what? I said, do you sleep in the nude? And he just looked at me and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> you know, and I remember asking another funny question that was out of order to Johnny Mathis. And I just said, have you thought about getting married? He said, well, I kind of like my status the way I am now. <laughs> so, but it was after listening to all of the things that they wanted to say and then hitting them with a question that came out of the blue. Okay, okay. Now, I saw a quote from you. Color is so obvious in this country. Please tell me how you feel today in seeing how far African Americans have come because of you paving the way for us. Well, I don't know if you would call it paving the way, but um, it happened that way. Uh -huh. Today, we're still facing the same problems. I don't suppose with after this uh, COVID thing and after the uh, Black Lives Matter that they feel, anyone that's been through this, feels that we've progressed that much. Uh -huh. And I'm sure that we're all still very aware and are very, uh, and are very conscious of things that can still happen to us, that it's not just everything we wanted, all the way we want it, and all the way for everyone else to move aside and accept this. It's not gonna happen like that, that quickly. It aroused more interest, yes. And it aroused more intelligent response, yes. But it's still there. And I don't think that we should go to sleep on the matter, that we have a lot to do, and a lot of, on both sides, a lot of ways to progress and to live with each other, and to appreciate and respect each other. I agree. Now, I did see a picture of you with Martin Luther King. So did yes. you actually have the opportunity to interview him? Yes, I did, but not on film. That oh. was when I the radio. I did it. I No, I used to carry my own camera and get my own interviews. And I, okay. I took that back. I was able to get him on tape, but I don't know if it ever, I don't know where it went to. Let me put it that way. I don't okay. know who has it or if it, someone else has it, but I used to think do my own taping. Now, what was your most memorable moment, whether it's who you interviewed on the radio or on TV? I can't say that because there were so many good times with people, I never had very bad moments, ugly moments with anyone that I've interviewed. There's always been something fresh to learn, something interesting that turns out when you start talking to people. Um, and for me to say which one I enjoyed most, of course I've enjoyed talking to Martin Luther King. I enjoyed talking to Lady um, Johnson when they came here for, to Philadelphia. But I, I've enjoyed this so many, it's so hard to say which one was better than another. There's right. only one that I, re, two I regret. I did do about a half an hour with Pearl Bailey, only to find out that I never turned the recorder on. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was sorry about that, very sorry about that. And I did do Cab Calloway, if you ever oh, remember okay. that. Cab Calloway, and I did him at someone's home. And I, when we were finished talking, I said, I'm surprised you're not your bubbly self that you are on the stage. He said, I don't get bubbly when I'm home. And he said, it just like that. I don't get bubbly when I'm home. That's an act. Okay. <laughs> so that kind of threw me. And Dizzy Gillespie, I waited two hours to interview him. Okay. And he, you know, you're not worth all of that time. He said, well, next time, I'll be early. Oh. And he I'll be early. <laughs> so uh, the, those are the only three times that I've been disappointed, I'll say, I'll say in an okay. interview. But other than that, it would be hard for me to say who was my best. I remember many of them. And from here, there, now and then, they come back to me. Mm -hmm. but, uh, half of them are gone now. 
Yeah. I can't go back and say to them, I'm still here. Right. Right. What message would you have for the young African American who is doubting their dreams, who is second guessing themselves? What message would you have for them? Well, they don't have to second guess themselves because now we have so many and they have numbers of young actors, uh, male and female, doing it from the national level right down to the local level. So they don't have to wonder about anything. They can see what people accept. But they can also develop their own technique. They don't have to copy someone because there are ways that they can learn. Don't forget, we didn't have any training programs when I was coming through. I didn't have a Diane Carroll even, even though I knew her well. I didn't have her to watch or she to watch me. That, that, that's the way it would have been maybe, but she didn't yeah. have it at that point. But um, so there's too many avenues, but the main thing to remember is to develop your own technique and your own way. I, one way I can tell them how they can remember things instead of taking it down on a piece of paper like I should have done today. <laughs> Don't do that. Listen. Uh -huh. Listen to your first answer. Have your first answer ready uh -huh. when you read them and say something. But the first answer from there on in, listen to what they say, and that will tell you what your next answer should be. Okay. So what if are you, you doing stuck, now? If you get stuck, Melody, if you get stuck, you can always say, well, would you explain that just a little bit more? Yeah. And that gives you time to get it together. <laughs> okay. So what are you doing now? That. Go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, don't worry. So what are you doing now with all of your time? Remembering. <laughs> remembering a lot. My husband isn't well, and I think about times that we've had together that I miss. Okay. And um, some of the friends that I have not seen for a while. And those that are gone, I have very little family. So I had a lot of friends that are no longer with me, and I miss them. Yeah. Okay. Well, Miss Trudy, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. This is truly, truly an honor. I thank you so much for joining me today. I Listen, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to find out what you're doing, how you're doing it the ease with which you're doing it. You have a nice voice. Thank you. Well. I, can, I can listen to you. And um, it's a pleasure to know that you're out there getting people acquainted with others through the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me today. To all my African-American sisters and brothers, you know your dreams can come true with hard work and dedication. Do not be afraid of making mistakes and do not let fear hinder you from growing. Believe in yourself, encourage yourself, love yourself. You are special and you are unique. You could be the one to change the world. The power of one starts with you. Peace and blessings.